Uh, welcome to lecture 36 of game theory course. This is the last lecture of 12th week. Okay. In the previous lecture, we have calculated the uh, wage levels and uh, profit when it is ideal case where the principal can observe the F2 level of the agent, which means EH and EL. So let's go back. If EH was enforced by uh, the principal, the wage level would be W1, W2, W3 are 1 million, and the profit would be 4.75 million. If EL, low effort is in, enforced, the wage got really small, W1, W2, W3, 0 0.16 million. Uh, once again, this is pi L. The uh, profit for low effort level would be 3.59. So even though the cost side, the wage side goes down, the profit goes down, the X goes down a lot. That's why in this ideal case where the effort level was uh, is uh, observable, the profit uh, would be higher in a high effort. That's why the principal would choose high effort level. Saying that, one thing uh, we have to look at here, which is a little bit uh, special in particular, is in both cases, the W1, W2, W3 are same. Only difference is it, it was 1 million in EH case and 0 0.16 million in EL case. Why is that? Okay, The effort is something the agent can control. So if the principal said, okay, your wage would depend on the effort level, it's kind of relieving for the agent because when he decides to do the high effort, he can do it 100%. When he decides to low effort, he can do that with 100% probability. Saying that, when the effort level can be observed, connecting, like uh, making the wage as a function of, even partially a function of the outcome, profit x1, x2, x3, that is kind of unnecessary and even harmful. Why? The agent can control the effort, but not the outcome x1, x2, x3, the profit. Therefore, why? Because of the God intervention, the even though when it's a high effort, as we have seen in our example, the bad result X1 can come out 25% chance. When E is low, low effort, the good result X equal 9 million can come out with also 25% chance. Therefore, there's no guarantee high effort would end up with the higher wage and low effort would end up with low wage. I mean, from the principal's point of view, when he or she knows that the agent can only do the effort level, why would you put additional burden on the uh, risk averse agent to take that risk? So. This calculation shows when the effort level is observed, you'd better connect the uh, wage level to the effort level. So your, your effort level is high, you will get 1 million regardless of the profit x1, x2, x3. Okay, that's why W1, W2, W3 are equal. In addition to that, if your effort level is low, your uh, wage would be 0 0.16 million regardless of x1, x2, x3. So when your effort level is low, you are just lucky you get high profit 9 million, still you will pay 0 0.16 million. If your effort level is high, but you are unlucky, the outcome is only 1 million x1, still I'll pay you 1 million. That is the philosophy in it. And this calculation shows 
that only helps to maximize the principal's uh, expected profit. Okay. Why? As we have seen in the Otis example, the risk averse agent would hate risk, and if their salary is linked to the axis x1, x2, x3, the outcome, the profit, what would be happening is they would demand a higher wage. Why? Because they hate the risk, but the principal enforced them to take the risk. Accordingly, you have to give me more money, otherwise I'll quit, I'll go to another job, kind of thing. So that is totally unnecessary for the principal to do that because when he can observe the after level, the wage shouldn't be, better not be related to the outcomes x1, x2, x3. That's why x1 equals x2 equals x3, whether it is high effort or low effort. By not giving any unnecessary risk to the agent, which would end up paying him more. Okay, and here, uh, I mean, this is backward induction. The principal think about, oh, what if I enforce EH? What if I enforce EL? He ended up enforcing EH because that would give him 4.75 which is bigger than, uh, what was it, 3.95 million for low effort. So he would choose EH, putting W1, W2, W3 at 1 million. So that EH would be an equilibrium path, EL would be non-equilibrium path, but by backward induction, the principal should calculate the EH case, EL case, and he realized the payoff by enforcing is 4.75 million and uh, enforcing EL would be 3.59 million. So he chose EH to be the equilibrium path. Okay, that's why we call it subgame perfect equilibrium. Now, let's uh, get to more realistic. Uh, now we are going to assume that the effort level is not observable. It's not verifiable, it's not observable. What would be the subgame perfect equilibrium? Here, we have the principal want to maximize this. Once again, the profit. Let's assume that EH would be enforced, high effort level would be enforced. Of course, we are going to think about the low effort level later, but high effort level. The first one is saying participation constraint the reservation utility level, if the utility from working this uh, for this principle is lower than reservation utility, the agent will quit. So the utility, expected utility of the agent working for this uh, principle should be bigger than y equal to reservation utility in our example 400. And this is once again, same, the wage x1, x2, x3, the probabilities when effort is high, and high effort cost, which is in our example, 600. The new thing is the second line. Okay, this whole thing is one thing. The left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side. What is the left-hand side? It's the same as above. The utility, when the uh, agent choose to have high effort level, the probability of x1, probability of x2, probability of x3, and wages minus 600. The second line is the utility of the agent when it choose to have a low effort. This is probability of uh, getting x1 when the effort is low, the probability of x2 when effort level is low, the probability of x3 when effort level is low, and the wages minus zero. Why? The low effort level cost we assumed is zero. If it's not zero, you put some number here. Okay. So why the high effort levels uh, uh, utility should be bigger than y equal to low effort level? Because the principal want to enforce EH. Now the effort level cannot be observed. So how can possibly the uh, principle 
make the agent to choose high effort because it cannot be enforced, the agent should voluntarily choose high effort instead of low effort. The reason is by choosing high effort, his utility should be bigger than the case where he is choosing the low effort. Okay? The high effort. How is it possible? By giving a proper wage. So the first, first constraint is participation constraint. Prevent the worker to move to another company. The second one is the incentive constraint, which is making the agent to choose high effort level instead of low effort level. Now we have two constraints. Okay? So once so again, this sub game perfect equilibrium because W1, W2, W3 would be decided first. And the agent now had. So the strategy of principle is W1, W2, W3. The strategy of agent would be number one, choosing to quit or work for the principle. Second, choosing whether the high effort level or at low effort level. So there are two players, principal and agent. Principal moves first, the agent moves second. Principal want to pay off would be the profit. The uh, agent pay off would be utility function. And the strategy principal W1, W2, W3, the agent quit or stay and high effort, low effort. Okay? The Lagrangian again, now not only we have the first constraint, we have second constraint, lambda and theta, I said here, and you put everything in here. And once again, you differentiate with W1, W2, W3. But before that, let's think about this second constraint. Okay, let's go back here. The second constraint, oh, I think, uh, this second constraint was rewritten because P1H is quarter, P2H is quarter, P3H is half, P1L is something like that, and this is 600. So quarter, quarter, half, 600, half, quarter, quarter, things like that. Okay, the first part should be bigger than the second part. This whole thing should be bigger than or equal to zero. I mean, if you look at that, W2, W2, informed quarter, they cancel each out. Only thing left is, uh, other than 600, if this is bigger than equal to zero, 600 goes to the other side, and the left-hand side would be quarter, because it's a quarter minus quarter root to three, half root to three, quarter root to three minus quarter W1, root W1 should be, bigger than or equal to 600. One thing we should remember is from the principal's point of view, who decide W1, W3, he want to make the Ws as small as possible. And the difference between w, root W3, root W1 is 600 in for quarter, okay? So the first thing the uh, principle should do is making W1 zero. Of course, can it be negative? No, in reality, it, the wage cannot be negative. So the lowest possible W1 would be zero. Okay? Then, quarter root W3 should be bigger than or equal to 600 like this. So root W3 should be bigger than or equal to 2400. Okay? which means W3 should be 5.76 million. W3 squared 2400, 5.76 million. Okay? So we don't really have to worry about the second uh, constraint. We don't even have to differentiate. The second constraint would be totally satisfied if W3 equal 5.76, and W1, W2 are zero. But we have only one worry. Would that uh, satisfy the second, con first constraint, the participation constraint? 
If we put it here, W10, W20, W3 is 5.76 million, root to W3, 2400. By half, which should be 1200, minus 600, minus 400, it's still 200, bigger than zero. So if the second constraint is satisfied and minimized, W1, W2, 0, W3, 5.76 million, the first constraint, participation constraint, would be satisfied automatically. Is it always so? Not really. Here, somehow the incentive compatibility constraint satisfied, okay? And then by accident, the first uh, constraint satisfied too. Okay? We have two constraints. Uh, so it usually, usually, 99%, one constraint satisfied, the other is satisfied, or the other satisfied, one constraint. One constraint would be stronger than the other. In this case, the second constraint is stronger. So if you just satisfy second constraint, first constraint automatically satisfied. So we don't even have to differentiate. We know that this would be minimizing the wage so that this would be uh, this would be the maximizing W1, W2, W3 when you want to enforce EH. Okay? So, if you put this over here, then 1 million minus 0, 4 million minus 0, 9 million minus 5.76, and in front of it, the probability. Then, if I calculate it correctly, the pi h would be 2.87 million, which is considerably dropped from our 4.75. Okay, so from 4.75, 2.87. What about e h? e h is actually same as the observer EL. Why? I mean, because it's uh, not observable, if you go to here, you need participation constraint and constraint that EL would give you a better utility than EH. But then, usually, if you don't care about this constraint, because there is a 6 minus 600 here, minus 0 here, the EL is very easy to be achieved. So we can pretty much ignore the uh, second constraint, the first constraint and second con first, uh, first constraint and the objective function only. We already calculate it is E, once again, L, 3.59, W1, W2, W3, 0.16. Okay, the only thing we would check is if that's the case. W1, W2, W3, whether it's high effort or low effort, it's 0 0.16. This thing and this thing are same. Only the first part negative 600. Therefore, the high effort level would be definitely 600 less than low effort. So this, uh, there is effortlessly if the first condition, first constraint is satisfied, the second constraint, when EL is enforced, which means the uh, inequality goes the other way, the low effort levels uh, utility would be definitely 600 bigger than the high effort level. Okay? Therefore, uh, when we realize the high effort levels profit 2.87, the low effort levels profit would be, we already calculated, 3.59. 3.59 is bigger than 2.87. So now things changed. When it's ideal case, when the effort level can be observed, the principal has choose to uh, make the agent to uh, exert the high effort level, 
because that gives him like 4.75 higher profit. But when the uh, effort level is not observable, now one thing different, the A principle should give a huge wage, 5.76. It used to be 1 million, 1 million, now it's 5.76, the wage increased a lot. And the in principle's mind, okay, my profit would be increased if high up, under high effort, because the probability of uh, X3 would change to half instead of quarter. But then that is not enough to justify this high wage increase. So it's not as much as the uh, agent cheat, but principal can enforce, give in enough incentive, enough carrots to make the agent work, but the principal kind of give up. So, wow, I will make even less profit by giving him so much money. So if I just let him be lazy, low effort, I get 3.59, which is bigger than high effort case because I don't have to pay the agent that much, Zero, just 0 0.16 million instead of like 5.76 million. Understand? Okay. So in real case, the principal cannot observe the effort and wants to enforce EH. The wage has to be linked to profit, not the effort, because effort is not observable. But since uh, the agent is risk averse, the wage should be higher when it's linked to profit because the agent has to take over the risk which he hates. And when you make people do something he or she hates, you have to pay him. The profit from enforcing EH is smaller than the profit from enforcing EL. So principle that the agent to choose the low effort since the high effort is too costly which means the wage would increase too much. Okay? So, once again, this is a quite uh, difficult stuff. Uh, so, probably, unless you're a genius, you should take this uh, lecture over and over again, maybe three times, and look at the, uh, hand, the PPT I gave you. But, you know, all your previous student eventually understand, so I think you would be able to do that. Okay, this is the end of subgame perfect equilibrium and the moral hatchet, the principal agent problem. Okay, another lecture. Okay, we are entering another PPT, which should be given to you. Now, we are venturing into a new area, incomplete information game. This automatically means all the game, this is week 12, until now, you, I have taught you only something called complete information game. And now we are venturing into incomplete information game, which would be simpler. Complete information game is much, much, much simpler. If you think game theory is difficult already, you know, don't be in a hurry. The incomplete information game is like 10 times more complicated than the complete information game. Uh, good news is, uh, I mean, if you go to the graduate school, you are going to learn ab a lot about incomplete information game. But for now, you don't have to worry about it. We have only two, three weeks left and then we are going to just dip into the incomplete information game rather than really taking uh, care of it. Complete information game is players know each other's payoffs. They do not know what the other players would choose. They might not know the strategy, especially in the mixed strategy equilibrium, but they do not know uh, their payoffs. You know, rock, scissors, paper, if I give rock, the other give paper, the others win. And of course, everybody want to win. That was in complete information game. But what if someone want to lose to you? That is incomplete information game. Incomplete information game is some other players' payoffs are not known to other players. 
Okay, so uh, you're playing a uh, rock, scissor, paper game with your friends, friend uh, Mr. Park, and strangely, Mr. Park sometimes want to lose. Okay, and you don't know why. So it's some, you know, but that you're not sure whether he wants to lose all the time, whether he wants to win all the time. So you have uncertainty whether the other person like it or not. I am dating, a, like a, for example, when I, before marriage, I was dating a girlfriend, you know, and my girlfriend might want to watch a movie, might not, but she's not telling me. So I have to guess what is the probability that she would like to go to the movie theater or not, something like that. Or first, first date, you purchase a ticket for the, you're wondering, should I bring her to the baseball park or movie theater? First date. You know, actually, some female want to go to baseball park much more than go to the movie theater. But you have to decide before you were first date, whether would you bring her to the movie theater or baseball park? But then you do not know whether she loves go to baseball park more than movie theater or movie theater more than baseball park. That is the situation of incomplete information. Is the new TA lazy? Or is my boyfriend's cost of being faithful usually high, unusually high, which means my boyfriend is very likely to be unfaithful dating another girl while, while dating me? Or is he faithful? Or my TA lazy means cost of being diligent is very high or not. I mean, even the lazy TA can work very hard, but it's one thing to work very hard, but working very hard is very painful for him. But eventually, he will quit being diligent. The unfaithful boyfriend can be faithful, but being faithful is unusually costly to him. Eventually, he will be unfaithful. So this stuff would be dealt with from the next class. Thank you. This has been a lecture 36.